Hey everyone, Adam Keir, the Bluegrass Marketer. Today I'm going to talk about the Bluegrass community. Who can be involved and who can't be involved? To kick things off, I want to start with a quote by the late, great Bill Monroe on Bluegrass. He said, It's got a hard drive to it. It's scotch bagpipes and old-time fiddling. It's Methodist and holiness and Baptist. It's blues and jazz, and it has a high, lonesome sound. It's plain music that tells a good story. It's played from my heart to your heart, and it will touch you. What Bill describes there is the spirit of bluegrass. He wasn't saying that it needs to have only these specific instruments, or it needs to have only this groove. He's talking about the rich history that has helped create the genre and the music of bluegrass, and the fact that it, sh it should be relatable music that tells a good story. It needs to be authentic, and the deliverance needs to be authentic. He says it's played from my heart to your heart, which means that when he's playing that music, he's in that song, and he's playing it authentically. And he hopes that your heart is open to receiving that song. And if it is, it will touch you. It's touching music. It's real music. So I think when we evaluate bands and when we look at maybe performers that don't fit a traditional model of bluegrass and these bands want to be a part of their our bluegrass community and event producers are inviting these bands into the community and they're accepting, I think we need to be a little bit more open-minded in who we're saying is allowed to be a part of this community. I think the spirit of bluegrass should be primarily evaluated under three circumstances. Does this band tell a great story? Does this band perform those stories and perform their instruments with a passion? And are they fearless? Are they tackling subjects that are real but sometimes really difficult to talk about? In bluegrass, there's dark songs, there's light songs, there's beautiful songs, there's, you know, gruesome songs, and then there's a mix in some of those songs as well. But it's all about real stuff. These are real stories from true Americans for the most part. You know, we do have an amazing international following, but that's besides the point as well. So what I would ask for is that if there is a band that might seem more country or a little bit more quote-unquote rock and roll, even though Bill Monroe himself was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame as an early influencer, I think what we have to do is evaluate these bands more on their merit and say to ourselves, are they writing great songs? Are they playing with passion? And are they writing music that isn't afraid, that says some stuff that might piss people off, or it might make you think in a different way? And if those bands are interested in bluegrass music, have influences in bluegrass or country, and want to be a part of the bluegrass community, I think that the bluegrass community needs to be open enough to accept them. And that leads me to my second point, the posterity of bluegrass. How is bluegrass as its name and as a community going to survive moving forward? I'd like to reference another quote from the late, great Ralph Stanley. The soundtrack of Oh Brother is the most publicity I've gotten. I don't feel that I've lost any of my old fans, but I've gained new ones. This was a major blockbuster film produced by, you know, big-name directors with big-name actors, George Clooney being the, um, the biggest, for sure. This was a popular movie. But being popular and having that exposure to such a wide audience allowed Bluegrass to be exposed to more people, and it really sp helped spark this Bluegrass renaissance, which I still believe we're in the midst of. It got young performers in, in, interested in the genre, and it reinvigorated old ones. So for bluegrass posterity, for bluegrass to survive, I think we need as a community to invite performers that are writing great music and have a tradition either in 
folk or jazz or blues or pull influences from those genres and invite them to the bluegrass community because what's going to happen is that those performers audience is going to see that they're playing at this bluegrass event and they might come and they're going to be exposed to the more traditional you know gospel and progressive bluegrass bands and you know what i think there's a high affinity between the bands that are writing great music, playing it with passion and are fearless, and people and and people playing tr more traditional or progressive bluegrass, as however you define it. So I think that cross-selling strategy, as I would as I would label it, is vital for continuing to push the genre to younger audiences getting younger people involved in bluegrass, showing them what traditional is all about, showing them what real bluegrass is all about. Yeah, that's important. But you're not going to get their intent attention until you spark their interest by mixing in bands that they already like. End rant. <laughs> until next time.